Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to present some of the research I've been doing for the last 10 years. So today I'm going to talk to you about um, antisocial behavior in young people. Um, and I will argue that there are different subgroups of young people who show antisocial behavior. I'm going to be focusing on what we term conduct disorder, a psychiatric disorder in childhood and adolescence. And I'm going to show you that although people, uh, young people, uh, can be labeled as having conduct disorder, we have different subgroups who show different neurocognitive profile, behav behavioral profile, and also affective profile. I will also show you the result of a recently completed European project, uh, a multi-site study that's been conducted in seven countries across Europe, where we collected a host of different measures, among which uh, brain imaging. So first, I'd like just to thank the people in my lab. Uh, they've done all the work, and I get to travel to Estonia and meet you and present the results of the finding. But they are the people who really collected the data and worked really hard to make this project a success. And also the people from the FEMNAT CD study, that large European project which has focused on understanding the environmental and neurobiological factors implicated in conduct disorder in young people. This is a paper we published nearly a decade ago when I was based at the Institute of Psychiatry. Um, I was fortunate enough to work on a lot of different and novel projects when I was based at the Institute of Psychiatry. One of which was working with adults who had antisocial personality disorder. These were men showing a persistent pattern of antisocial and violent behavior from childhood onwards who'd been invited to come to the Institute of Psychiatry for a week, uh, taking part in a study where we would interview them about their childhood, um, about their current life, but also ask them to perform a number of experiments and tasks, um, some of which involve uh, neuroimaging scanning their brain. What struck me uh, when I was working with those men was that all of them had had a um, really uh, terrible childhood experience. All of them had experienced uh, maltreatment as children, um, and then the work I did subsequently uh, focused on understanding the impact of maltreatment on the brain. What's really fascinating is um, you can have several people experiencing the same toxic early environment like maltreatment, but some of them will develop depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorders, and others will go on to develop externalizing problems, antisocial, <coughs> aggressive uh, behavior, um, substance misuses. So in my research, my aim is really to try to understand how the same environment and neurological factors interact to produce this different outcome. And interestingly, you have young people who have also experienced the same toxic environment but they grow up to be successful and to be well adapted and don't show any sign of psychopathologies. They are what we call resilient. And a lot of my work is to try to understand the neurobiological and environmental factors that promote this good outcome in young people. Coming back to that paper, the main take-home message from that paper was that you need to characterize very well the participant you're working with. Because among the population of individuals who show antisocial and aggressive behavior, it's a very heterogeneous population with different subgroups who are characterized by different risk factors. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I will convince you that it is really important to understand what those environmental and neurobiological risk factors are for these different subgroups. Because this information is essential to inform prevention and treatment. And just to give you an example, one hour of neuroimaging costs 500 pounds, about 600 euros. There's no point in spending so much money on doing neuroimaging on the population of antisocial and aggressive behavior 
if you're not able to identify those subgroups very clearly. So, this is one of the most robust findings that you will find in criminology. Um, we know there's a small group of men who are responsible for the vast majority of crimes and violent crimes committed in society. These men um, commit many different types of crimes. They start early in childhood, and the statistics show that they are about 5% of the population. But they account for between 60 to 70% of all the crimes committed in society. In criminology, these men have been referred to as life course persistent offenders because they start in childhood, they continue in adolescence, and they persist through adulthood. In psychology, in psychiatry, the label that is used is antisocial personality disorder. So antisocial personality disorder is one of the 10 personality disorders that you will find in the psychiatric pathology. <coughs> but it's the only personality disorder which has in its diagnostic criteria a childhood antecedent. In other words, to be diagnosed in adult as having antisocial personality disorder, you need to have met diagnostic criteria for conduct disorder by the age of 15. So here we are looking at a disorder that starts in childhood and persists in adulthood. And it makes sense. If you think about a personality disorder, you don't turn 18 years of age and you receive a personality disorder for your birthday. There are childhood antecedents. There are precursor. And this is really specified in the psychiatric pathology. In childhood and adolescent, you should be able to identify factors, antecedents, that are like alarm bells. They should warn you that this young person is developing a really maladaptive, maladaptive personality trait. This finding has been shown in many different cultures, many different countries with different culture, education, healthcare, and criminal justice system. So it's a very robust finding that you find in many different countries. If you look at the male prisoner population, about 50 to 75% of these men will have had conduct disorder and have antisocial personality disorder. Among this subgroup, there's a smaller subgroup, which, which is characterized by what we call psychopathy. So psychopathy is also a personality disorder. It's a syndrome. It's a more severe form of antisocial personality disorder. In addition to showing antisocial and aggressive behavior, these individuals show key affective and interpersonal features that are specific to the syndrome of psychopathy. They are callous, remorseful, they lack empathy, guilt, um, and they're very manipulative. And as you can see, the relationship between antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy is what we call asymmetrical, in that most, if not all, the, the men who meet diagnostic criteria for psychopathy will have antisocial personality disorder. But among those with antisocial personality disorder, only a small subgroup will meet diagnostic criteria for um, psychopathy. In young people, I will also show you that we find these two subgroups. So what is really psychopathy? We know it's associated with a greater number of crimes. They commit more violent crimes. They are more likely to recidivate when they are released from prison. And these are the key characteristics. They lack empathy, remorse. They start offending at a young age. They use aggression in a very instrumental way, premeditated aggression to obtain what they want. And usually we say psychopathy can be um, defined by two factors. Factor one in blue is what we call the key affective interpersonal feature of psychopathy. They're glib, they're grandiose, they're pathological liar, they lack remorse, they, shall, they show shallow affect, and they have a callous lack of empathy. These features, we can identify them as well in young people. And this is going to be a key part of my talk today. I'm going to show you that among young people with conduct disorder, there's a smaller subgroup who show high level of those callous and emotional traits. This factor two 
is what is shared with antisocial personality disorder. Aggressive behavior, impulsivity, early juvenile delinquency. These are features that you find in a lot of um, individuals in prison. The blue aspect, the affective interpersonal feature, are really found in a small subgroup. Now, there's good evidence that both antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy are neurodevelopmental disorder. In other words, we know that brain abnormality are occurring early in development, which are responsible for the development of these disorders. So it makes sense to try to go back in time and to try to identify that among young people who show severe antisocial behavior, the more at risk of developing antisocial personality disorder and psychopathy. Among young people who show conduct disorder, 50% will not go on to develop a full-blown personality disorder. And we need to understand more about the environmental and neurological factor that favor, that promote this desistance from um, this uh, um, uh, problematic path. So, conduct disorder. It is basically antisocial and aggressive behavior in young people. If you look in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, you will see that the symptoms fall into four categories. The externalizing problems, aggression to people and an animal, destruction of property, but also what we call the covert symptoms, like lying, truancy, violations of rule. I'm going to argue that this population of young people with conduct disorder is very heterogeneous, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. These are the symptoms, 15 symptoms uh, or diagnostic criteria that we use to diagnose conduct disorder in young people. To be diagnosed with conduct disorder, the young person needs to meet three of these criteria in the last 12 months. And one of them has to be present in the last six months. If you look at 15 symptoms, there are 32,000 possible combination of, of criteria to reach a diagnosis of conduct disorder. In other words, you can have 100 youth with conduct disorder, they might be completely different. One young person might just meet the diagnostic criteria of conduct disorder, and then the diagnostic criteria will be satisfied mostly for the COVID symptoms, the, the less severe symptoms. And you have a young person who will have 15 of the criteria, and he or she will show a host of externalizing um, overt and covert symptoms. So this is really should convince you that if you have a young person who has a diagnostic, um, diagnosis of conduct disorder, it is very difficult to understand how he or she might present to you because of these possible combinations. And this has been recognized for decades, and the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, has recognized this heterogeneity. In 1994, the distinction between childhood onset and adolescent onset was introduced. So there are some young people who start showing conduct disorder in childhood, before age 10. So they have a childhood onset. But for the majority, they show conduct disorder an onset after the age of 10 in adolescence. For this group, the adolescent onset type, we know that they have different risk factors. They're particularly um, influenced by peer, antisocial and deviant peers. So if you, look at the, if you look at the relationship between age and crime, you will see that there's a peak in adolescence. And we think that the peak in adolescence of crime is related to this very fact that in adolescence, some young people will start acting out and showing antisocial and aggressive behavior. You can also define conduct disorder as mild, so the young person will just satisfy three of the criteria. Some of these criteria might be like theft, truancy, violation of rules, or the young person can show severe conduct disorder with several symptoms, including use of weapons, um, aggressions and violence towards people. So this is something that is important to have in mind. In the last uh, incarnation of the DSM, the DSM-5, an additional specifier was included, included with limited pro-social emotion. 
And this is basically what we term callous and emotional trained young people. This specifier was introduced because 20 years of research has shown us that among young people, there's a subgroup who, in addition to showing conduct disorder, show those psychopathic tendencies, those callous and emotional traits. So to be um, diagnosed with limited pro-social emotion, the young person has to meet diagnostic criteria for conduct disorder, and to be labeled with limited pro-social emotion, he or she needs to have two of these four criteria in the last 12 months, and they need to show it in different relationships and different settings. In the rest of my talk, I will show you that young people who have common disorder and high level of callous and emotional trait or limited pro-social emotion show different patterns of response to punishment, but also their brain responds very differently to social stimuli, like faces. In addition to this distinction, we know that comorbidity is the norm. In other words, young people with common disorder will show other externalizing and internalizing problems. A lot of them will show attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, anxiety disorder, depression, but also substance misuse. So this makes it even more complex. Among that group of young people with conduct disorder, you have also a substantial proportion of these young people who have additional psychiatric disorder, which make prevention and intervention even more complex and difficult. And I'll come back to that towards the end. And also to convince you that it is really important to look at conduct disorder, this was a study published over a decade ago, but it was very important in changing the view among mental health professionals, but also people working with young people. That study showed that if you have conduct disorder at age 50, you are much more likely to have other psychiatric disorder in adulthood. In other words, this study showed that conduct disorder is an important prevention opportunity. Between 25% and 65% of the young people in that study had conduct disorder, and conduct disorder preceded all these other disorders, substance misuse, schizophrenia, anxiety, and depression. So it really changed the view in that it is really important to actually look at those young people who exhibit aggressive and antisocial behavior because it can be a valuable uh, target for prevention and intervention. We know that conduct disorder is a really important risk factor for a host of problems in adulthood. Mental health in the UK and in the United States it is the most common reason for referral to childhood and adolescent mental health services. Legal I will show you the cost associated with conduct disorder in a minute. Educational. Conduct disorder is associated with a high rate of school dropout, but also in the European Union, it is one of the most common reasons for teacher burnout. Occupational. They have difficulty to train um, for jobs and to sustain jobs. Physical health. That is something that is not discussed a lot. These are individuals, by the time they reach adulthood, they are in poor physical health. They have used drugs, alcohol, they have traumatic brain injury, and they are a, a, a substantial burden to the mental health and the healthcare system. And you can see that even among young children aged 4 or 5, you can identify those who might be at risk of developing problems 5 years later. So we have now good instruments to identify, even in young, young uh, children, those who might be at risk of developing this maladaptive uh, pattern of behavior and personality trait. This is a study which basically show you how um, costly conduct disorder is uh, to society. This was a study done in England, um, and two months ago, a similar study showing the very same result was published in New Zealand. So it is just to show you that it is not just in the UK, you will find it in other, in other cultures. 
But look, this was a study that followed young people up to the age of 28. By the age of 28, those with conduct disorder cost society 10 times more than those who had no conduct problems. And you will notice that the cost was associated with crime, not really with health, because these young people don't receive treatment, at least in the UK. So um, this is really to show you that it is really an important target for, uh, for work. So getting really to the, the meat of this talk, I will show you that there are these two subgroups of young people with conduct disorder. You will see that those who have callous and emotional trait show the lack of emotional responsiveness to negative stimuli, in particular facial expression of fear and sadness in others. They don't react to distress in others like we do. In contrast, the other group of youth with conduct disorder who have low level of callous and emotional trait, they present very differently. They show high level of emotional dysregulation. They show aggression that is very reactive. When you work with them, you have the feeling that you're almost working with nitroglycerin. Anything can set them off. And I'm going to show you that these subgroups are characterized by a very different behavioral and affective profile. The majority of young people with conduct disorder will fall in the category with low callous and emotional trait. The group with conduct disorder and callous and emotional trait makes up about 20-25% of young people with conduct disorder. So they are the minority, but like the adult counterparts, they are really responsible for a disproportionate amount of crime, and they are very difficult to, to treat and to work with. But there is some evidence that intensive treatment can help to reduce the level of antisocial behavior they show. So how do you assess callous and emotional trait? Several instruments have been um, created in the last um, two decades. Um, I've just listed them here. Uh, I use mostly the inventory of callous and emotional trait. These are questionnaires. Questionnaires that you can give to the young person, so self-report. In my work, we mostly use information from the teacher and the parent, and we combine the information from the parent and the teacher together, because the parent give, can give information about what's happening in the, house, in the house. The teacher will also have a good overview of the child, how they behave with their peers at school. The self-report, um, there are problems with it in that you might not be confident that the young person will be telling the truth. But in our experience, they also are more likely to report behaviors that the parent or the teacher will not be able to report. So in other words, it's really important to try to combine information from different sources. And again, like with the adult um, antisocial personality and psychopathy, these instruments will identify two domains, the callous and emotional aspect, so where emotions are fake, where there's the callous, the lack of empathy, they're not concerned about others' feelings, they're insincere, they're manipulative, they blame others for their own mistakes. So these are the core features of um, what we see in the adult syndrome of psychopathy. And then there's the antisocial and impulsive domain that you will find in many young people who show conduct disorder. So, those who show this childhood onset conduct disorder, high level of callous and emotional trait. They show a more severe and stable pattern of aggressive behavior. But importantly, they are unique in the sense that they show high level of what we call proactive or instrumental aggression. They use aggression to obtain something, and they think it's uh, appropriate to use aggression to resolve um, uh, problems with their peers. Um, they are, they're really looking after themselves, and they think that being aggressive uh, should bring reward, should bring something that is good for them. They're basically looking at the number one, and aggression is okay to be used in that, in that case. They're also characterized by a particular uh, pattern of processing social information. In particular, I've already mentioned, they have a deficit in processing 
uh, fearful and sad faces in others. And I'm going to show you how their brain reacts to fearful faces. They're also much less sensitive to punishment cues. And you can see that in um, one of my colleagues in Australia has been working with young people, uh, age four or five, in a parent training program. And uh, one of the, the things that you are taught as a parent, or that you learn, is that if your child is misbehaving, you will punish them. You will, for example, put them on the notice step or in timeout. They say, okay, you just go in here, you punish for what? The young people with callous and emotional trait, it doesn't affect them. They don't care about that. It doesn't really affect them. They're really sensitive to reward, and I'm going to show you that. And this has implications for how we work with them clinically. As I said, they're expecting positive outcome when they're being aggressive. They are fearless and thrill seeker. One of the young people we worked with when I was in London at the Institute of Psychiatry, he enjoyed playing near the railway track. He enjoyed waiting for the train, and just before the train would arrive, he jump across the, the train track just to, to feel alive. You see that in the other with psychopathy. We usually say they like to, to live the life on the edge. So these features, these temperamental features, are, we think, important and interfere with the development of conscience. They make these children much more difficult to parent. By contrast, those young people who conduct disorder and learn about callous and emotional traits present very differently. They typically do not show problems with empathy and guilt. These are children, they might be aggressive, they might react, they might hit their peers, but they will feel sorry after. And they will show genuine understanding that what they've done is wrong. The problem is that they have very great difficulty to regulate their behavior and their emotions. They show high rate of anxiety, and they show what we call a hostile attributional bias. When they are processing facial expression, if they see a neutral facial expression, they will be much more likely to say, that facial expression is showing anger. They, sh they see malicious intent when there's n there are no reason to see that. And we think that is because of harsh parenting, early childhood maltreatment. These are young people who are very good at detecting whether a face is turning from a neutral to an angry face. They're less aggressive, and their aggression is tend to be much more reactive. If they feel threatened, they will react in an aggressive manner. It's not to say that those with high callous and emotional traits don't show reactive aggression. They will show reactive aggression, but the cause for the reactive aggression is different. In those with high level of callous and emotional traits, they might show reactive aggression when they are frustrated, when they don't get what they want. Whereas in those with low callous and emotional traits, it's more when they feel threatened. So based on these differences in affective and behavioral profile, we decided to conduct a neuroimaging study some years ago, where we invited three groups of young people um, to uh, have a brain scan. We had a group of control, typically developing youth. We had a group with conduct problems and low level of callous and emotional trait, and a group with conduct problems and a high level of callous and emotional trait. And we, we show them faces in the scanner. We show them fearful faces, because we know that when you see fearful faces, there are parts of your brain that become very active, and in particular, the amygdala. The amygdala is a small almond-shaped structure deep down in your limbic system. It's at the core of your basic threat response system. If there is a snake that comes here, my amygdala will light up. It is uh, basically to draw my attention to something that might be dangerous, okay? So we had those young people, those three group of young people, and we showed them fearful faces, but we showed them for 17 milliseconds. So they, they couldn't see those faces. We showed them those faces subliminally. Their brain could see it, but they couldn't consciously see those faces. And we hypothesized that the amygdala, that structure, 
would respond very differently across the three groups. We expected that the children with low level of callus and emotional traits, so those who show emotional dysregulation, would show heightened amygdala response, whereas those with high level of callus and emotional traits would show lower amygdala responses, not really responding to these signs of threat. And that's exactly what we found. So here you have the amygdala response in the middle, here, for the comparison subject. On the left, you see those with low level of callus and emotional trait, those who show emotional dysregulation. And you can see heightened responses to those fearful faces in the amygdala. Look at those with conduct problems and high level of callus and emotional trait. The completely brain response, the pattern in the amygdala is completely the opposite. A dampened response in the amygdala to these signals of fear. They're less responsive to the signals of distress or fear in others. And there's some evidence suggesting that this amygdala response is linked to instrumental and proactive aggressions. So I'm going to show that to you a bit later. So, hopefully this has convinced you that we have these two subgroups. They show different behavioral and affective profile. In the paper we published some years ago, we identified one of the challenges. The challenges was to identify differences based on sex. And the idea is, a lot of the research has been conducted in male, because conduct disorder is more prevalent in male. But the idea was, with a new project we just conducted, was to try to redress that imbalance, and to try to understand more about conduct disorder in female. Because there's some evidence that the prevalence of conduct disorder in female has been increasing in the last decade. So, the prevalence has increased. But importantly, there are pronounced sex differences according to sex in conduct disorder. The development and the course of the disorder is different in male and female. Male tend to show an onset in childhood, whereas female tend to show an onset more in adolescence. And we know that early onset of puberty is one of the most important risk factors for, the onset, uh, for uh, the onset of conduct disorder in female. The pattern of comorbidity is also quite different, and we've seen that also in our study. Males tend to show comorbidity with ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, whereas females tend to show comorbidity with an internalizing problem, like PTSD, depression, and anxiety. So, we set up the FEMNAT CD project. It started in 2013 and finished in 2018 uh, across seven countries. We recruited nearly 2,000 young people, um, and uh, we conducted a series of uh, evaluations, including neuroimaging evaluations, but also we asked them to uh, play some computer games to see how they perceive the world, how they process emotions, but how also how they respond to reward and punishment. So I'm not going to go into detail, but we looked at how they process emotion. We looked at how they learn from punishment and reward. Uh, and this is important in everyday life. If you do something and you get punished, you learn that you shouldn't be doing it. If you do something and you get rewarded, you learn that you should continue what you're doing. Okay? This is as the basis of how we learn. And we looked at how they regulate their emotions. So I'm going to show you the result of how they process faces and how they learn from punishment and reward. So this is data, um, a paper that is currently in, in preparation by my colleague in, in Germany, Gregor Kohls and Kirsten Kodra. Um, this is the description of the sample. At the time, we had uh, collected nearly a thousand young people, and you can see how they divided into those with conduct disorder and control. They were aged on average 14 years, and you can see that among the young people with conduct disorder, a number of them had additional comorbidity, ADHD, depression, substance use problem, anxiety, and PTSD. And we use a task to look at how they process emotion. We look at how they process the six basic emotions. Um, and we, those faces are morphed with different emotions. So you can see an angry faces, 
that he's 90% angry and 10% happy, or you can see a happy face is that he's 90% happy and 10% angry. These percentage allows allow you to look at how they process different stages of emotions. They just had to say which emotion was presented. What you can see is that the young people with conduct disorder across the board were impaired at recognizing the emotions that were presented. They were significantly so for fear, for sadness, for surprise and happiness. And for the other two emotions, not statistically significantly, but still poor at recognizing what the emotions was presented. The male and the female with conduct disorder didn't differ. Both male and female showed a similar impairment with conduct disorder, uh, with in relation to faces. What we notice is that ADHD was really important in uh, explaining the pattern of, of responses to those faces. This is the task that we used to look at how they process reward and punishment. They saw abstract shapes. Some of these shapes were punished, and some of these shapes were rewarded. And they, they basically had to work out which of the shapes were associated with punishment and which of the shapes were associated with reward. If they were um, showing, um, if they were selecting the correct shape, they were rewarded. That's a correct response. If they were not responding to a shape that was rewarded, is what we call an omission error. If they were selecting a shape uh, that was punished, that was a passive avoidance error. They responded for a shape that was punished, and they shouldn't have. And if they didn't respond, they didn't respond that was a correct <coughs> avoidance. What we show is that the young people with conduct disorder, they're more likely to respond to the shape that are punished, so they make more passive avoidance error. They have difficulty to learn which of the shapes are punished. And they make, but interestingly, they make less error for the rewarded shapes. So they are basically focusing on the shapes that are giving them reward. So you have this pattern where they are highly sensitive to reward, but poor at detecting punishment information. There were no differences between the male and the female. And again, ADHD was very important to explain the pattern of finding. I'm going to skip that. So, no unique pattern of sex differences in how they process emotions and how they process reward and punishment information. But what this information is important for intervention programs that are targeting um, different aspects of how you process emotion and how you learn in everyday life. And there are some new interventions that can help you to uh, improve how you process emotions and how you process reward and punishment information. So, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip to probably the bit that is the most inter interesting to you all. Is the implication for treatment